So hello and welcome to this session, everybody. I'm Lou Woodley. I'm the director of the Centre for Scientific Collaboration and Community Engagement, or CSCCE for short. And we're going to slightly change focus here. So I know that um, we've spent um, a lot of time over the course of the conference thinking about technical infrastructure. In this session, we're going to think about human infrastructure. So CSCC focuses primarily on the role of the community manager in STEM. So community managers are the people who are responsible for nurturing and supporting collaborative work in a range of different contexts. And that uh, very often involves using technologies and very often involves helping to support emergent leaders, uh, sometimes called maintainers, who step up um, and help to, to maintain and evolve those technologies. So um, what we want to do today um, is explore that role of the community manager and specifically a framework that describes how members within a community or collaboration can interact with one another. So um, just a few words about this um, title community manager. Now, lots of folks are involved in doing uh, facilitation, in promoting member engagement, and may not be called a community manager. That's okay, you can be carrying out this function without this being your job title. So some folks are lucky enough that this is their full-time role. Others are um, doing this as a hybrid position. So might be doing communications, might be doing technical product management, um, or may even be just wearing this as a temporary hat, for example, um, in the context of organizing a conference and, and helping to support member engagement around that. So we don't mind whether this is a, a part-time role that you carry out or, or something that you do full-time, CSECE is here um, to support you in these roles. So what we're going to do in this session today is we're going to hear from five community managers, and again, not all of them are called community managers by their job descriptions, and we're specifically going to relate the work that they do to five modes of member engagement that we've described in the CSECE community participation model. So I'll recap what the model is, uh, make sure we're on the same page about what those five modes are, and then I'm going to walk us through um, some conversations with the panel um, to have them explain what that model um, plays out like in their own community contexts. And then the idea is, is that you'll leave with a new way of describing what happens or needs to happen in your own community uh, with some ideas from the panelists about how you can get there. So um, as I mentioned right at the beginning, we are going to be uh, focusing on the CSEC community participation model, which is described in a lot more detail in this freely available guidebook. So you can download that from Zenodo. That includes quite a few FAQs that we've regularly been asked about the model. So if you want to explore it further, we recommend downloading that and having a look afterwards. We do also have a shared notes doc today, so we want you to feel uh, able to actively engage in this session. And so as we walk through um, the various different stages of the model with the panelists, uh, please feel free to find the corresponding mode of the model in the collaborative notes doc and put examples that you can think of from your own communities and your own collaborations. This will end up creating um, a nice resource that we can come back to later so we can see what other folks are doing in their own communities. You might identify some people to reach out to to get tips and tricks of how they're doing a particular thing or think of new things that you might want to try in your own context. So please feel free to dive into that doc and, and add to it to grow it to being a collaborative resource. And then just in terms of um, the order of play, so roughly how long we want to spend on each thing, um, I'm going to describe the model um, in a moment. I'm going to take five minutes or less to do that. Then I'm going to hand over to our panellists to introduce themselves. And then we're going to walk through a few questions to really explore the model and what that looks like. Uh, if all goes to plan, that will lead to about 20 minutes at the end. And we can dive into any questions that you have about the model or specific things that you want to follow up with about the panellists or anything that you've dropped into the collaborative notes doc that we want to explore in more detail. So please um, put questions in the chat as we go, put them in the collaborative doc as we go, um, and we'll try and allow some time at the end to have uh, a discussion with all of us. Okay, so um, to make sure that we're all on the same page, let me just uh, take a few moments now to walk us through the CSEC community participation model. So this is a model that we've developed to describe the way that members engage with one another in the context of a community based project. And one of the reasons that we created this is the word community has now become somewhat overextended. We're hearing it used a lot in a lot of different contexts. 
And we wanted to add a level of nuance to uh, be able to describe exactly what was going on in these various different contexts and exactly what kind of member engagement was happening uh, in those various uh, different projects. And so what the model does is it describes four modes of member engagement that happen within a community. So that's these here uh, shown by these little network diagrams. So we start off with convey, consume, then we move to contribute, then to collaborate, and then to co-create. And then we have a fifth meta mode, uh, which we call the champion mode, which is when uh, emergent leaders step up and want to take on additional responsibility to help to maintain, to grow, or to evolve the community in some way. So in the context of um, software, we can think of those folks as being um, maintainers, uh, as well as others that might be um, serving in um, various other roles, committees, working groups, and so on, to help move forward uh, the mission of the overall project. What we see along the top here uh, is a description of information flow um, that's occurring between members. So in this transmissive state, uh, if we take the, the dot in the middle as being the convening organization, the, the core project team, whoever that might be that's uh, convening the community, in the transmissive mode, so in convey mode, um, those folks are pushing out information to individual community members. So very much kind of like a broadcast channel. And these members aren't actually interacting with each other. So if all you're doing in this mode is something like sending out a newsletter, um, you're not really um, all the way to having a community because folks are not necessarily interacting with each other in any way. As we move along, we then get into a transactional mode of information exchange. So this is where we kind of, we understand the terms of engagement. There's some kind of transaction taking place um, a bit more back and forth. Um, but again, we've not necessarily got to realize the full potential that we can see in community when we get all the way to transformational. So this is where, uh, you know, the magic of community happens that we really get the, the release of that collective knowledge, the ability um, to co-create something brand new together. Um, and so for many projects, this might be um, where you're aiming to get to, but we don't try and attach value judgments. It may not be that that's where your community is right now, or even where it needs to go to realize its particular goals. So this is really about helping you to think through what it is that your members are doing with each other, what programming you're creating to support that, and then where it is that you think you need to go in order to be able to realize the things that you want to do together as a community. Now, I'm not going to walk through all the things in the, the table below. Needless to say, these are all just to, to help um, go in a level deeper and understand the model. Um, but just to um, flag up the issue of power balance here, right? So, um, you know, we think a lot about power and, and um, inclusion as community managers. And um, here in this transmissive mode, so when we're um, conveying information out for community members to consume, it's often the organization or the conveners being positioned as expert. This isn't always a bad thing, by the way. Again, we're careful with the value judgments here. Sometimes there might be an output that's been created by a working group that you want to disseminate. Um, and so passing that out as a, as a product to then be discussed um, is a normal part of that uh, life cycle. As we move to contribute, the power balance shifts to organization as convener. So inviting folks in, creating these opportunities to actually come in and start to engage, usually in fairly um, easy ways where there's a, a low barrier to, to actually engaging and getting involved. And then as we move on to collaborate, um, we describe this as scaffolded cooperation. And I'm really fond of this word scaffolding. Community managers do a lot of creating of the pathways, lowering of the barriers to entry to enable members to really just get on and, and do the work of uh, interacting with one another and producing whatever it is that they want to do together. And then finally, when we get into the co-create phase, as I said, this is where the magic happens. So very intentionally here, the convener of the organization has shrunk down much more to being on sort of near parity in terms of um, size here. So that's really giving up some of that power and some of that control and saying, hey, we might not even know exactly how we're gonna get to, to the solution here, but we want to be in co-creation with one another to figure that out. And so the slogan here is, well, what should we do next? You know, we don't know as the convener, we need to figure this out together in community. So briefly, just to recap some of the points now that are down on the uh, right hand side, the goal isn't necessarily to get all the way across to the right. So I know often we sort of look at these things and we go, oh, how can I quickly get to be the best possible? You know, there's not necessarily a value judgment attached here. Um, the interactions may differ depending on what it is that you're trying to um, do and build together with your community. 
And so the importance here is to match your community goals to the engagement modes that you need. The second thing is that this isn't sort of a life cycle model. It's not that we're saying, right, everybody in your community is going to shift all the way over to co-create. You might, and you almost certainly are going to be using multiple of these modes at once. So I mentioned the example that you know, a working group might co-create together. They might then disseminate what they've produced more broadly by using this convey consume mode. We talked about the importance of power dynamics. Again, always important to have that in mind uh, to really think about um, how you're enabling members to engage with one another. And then um, this idea of supportive scaffolding. So what can you provide as a convener, as a, an organization to make it as easy as possible for members to move between the modes? Okay, so that's all I wanted to um, say about the model. So hopefully that gets us all um, roughly on the same page in terms of thinking about what that looks like. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. So as I said, we have five community managers um, here today. And first thing we're gonna do is go around and have them introduce themselves. And they're gonna tell us briefly about the communities that they work with and what being a community manager looks like for them in their own particular community context. So we're gonna start first of all with Katie, who works with me at CSCCE. So over to you, Katie. Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, my name's Katie Pratt. I am the communications director and content archivist at the Center for Scientific Collaboration and Community Engagement. Um, one of the things that we do at the center is we convene a community of practice of almost 250 scientific community managers. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, we are managing that community and our team spreads that role across everything that we do. So we're always operating in all four modes, but I suppose on a day-to-day -day basis, I generally spend most of my time as a communications person on convey and consume, and then as a content creator by collaborating with members of our community. Awesome, thank you very much, Katie. So next we have Emily. Hi everyone, I'm Emily Lesak. Um, I'm the conference fund manager at Code for Science and Society, where I develop and now manage a program that provides funding and support for research-driven open data science events. And I operate mostly in the convey mode um, where I um, convey our RFP, advertise it to potential applicants, and also provide resources for best practices in event planning, and develop programming for grantees to help them um, create successful events. Awesome, thanks very much, Emily. Uh, next we have Malin. Hi, uh, I'm not muted, I am. No, you hear me. Uh, so I'm Malin Sandstrom, I'm with the INCF. I've been a community manager for 12 years, if you count. Uh, the official roles, but actually a few years before too, if I go back and look at it with my community manager eyes. So INCF is a neuroscience standards and best practices organization that works to make neuroscience more fair. And if you know the fair principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, you also know that they place a lot of emphasis on community, community governance, community decisions on what is a good standard, community reviewing and developing standards. And so that's what we do in essence, we create a community activity around neuroscience standards and we go out and look for other standards that may have arisen somewhere else in the community. And we also try to get people to work on standards in areas where there are no existing standards or where there are 10 conflicting standards. That's the more usual case. Everybody wants to make their own standard, basically. And uh, when I entered INCF, I had the role of scientific communications and PR officer. And I spent most of my time in the convey consume mode. I laid up newsletters and made print materials that we brought to conferences. And uh, after a while, I also was the manager for a task force in our scientific program on multi-scale modeling because my background is in computational neuroscience and I'm the only company person at INCF. And so I worked with that task force to try to make their work easier. Uh, they had a very tricky task of joining forces from different sort of rival uh, and tries to do the same thing. So um, it, there was a lot of 
conflict management and discussion and not that much progress until finally in the end they published something. And that's an um, XML description of how you set up your computational model. So basically this uh, much of the discussion in this group uh, trickled out into the rest of the community into other tools. So they didn't produce any much uh, specific things that we can point to, but there was a lot of leveling up in the rest of the community as a result. So that was fine. And then I took a break from work because I had twins. And when I come back, we changed my role to be at the community engagement officer. And that means I work with the community to facilitate collaborations broadly. I do some of our communications as a part of the communications team. I do some reports. I do, I do a fairly many things. I have a CV that's 14 pages long describing this. Um, so yeah, that's it. Great, thank you very much, Malin. And yeah, ma many uh, different hats that, that community managers wear. So Alicia, over to you next. Hello everyone. Um, good morning on our end, I'm on the West Coast. My name is Alicia Wood Charleston and I work at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And I'm kind of representing a couple of different communities because as Tulu pointed out, you know, we wear several hats. One of them is, um, funded by the Department of Energy called the DOE Systems Biology Knowledge Base. It's a open science um, data analytics platform for systems biology data and research. And then the other one is the National Microbiome Data Collaborative, which is a brand new community. It's a pilot initiative to try to make microbiome data fair. So as Mullen said, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, my background is in marine microbiology. And as I joined the National Lab, I actually worked a lot with Lou to write my own job description in the end. So my title is a user engagement lead. And the two communities are in very different places. The, the NMDC is brand new. And so most of our uh, stages are very much sort of convey and uh, you know getting messaging out and trying to figure out what our messaging is to the community and then asking for feedback um, oftentimes during like user interviews to understand how people wanna work with data and how they might wanna work with the discovery interface. Kbase is a bit more established. And so I'm really trying to push that community towards Collaborate, um, where we're working with researchers to understand their data and their, their questions so that we can uh, make sure to develop tools to help support some of the analyses they wanna do moving forward. Um, the NMDC has one community manager full-time um, and my job is to sort of figure out how to do the strategy part. Uh, Kbase has a bit uh, bigger team for outreach because we do quite a few, well, not right now, but we did do a lot of in-person events and now we've all shifted to webinars, but um, that takes a, a bit more staffing to, to manage some of the uh, in-person interactions for those. Thanks. Great, thank you, Alicia and Rachel. Hi, my name is Rachel Ainsworth. I am the Research Software Community Manager for the UK's Software Sustainability Institute. And my responsibilities include project managing the Institute's fellowship program and the collaborations workshop series. Um, so I scaffold opportunities for member engagement across all of the modes in the community uh, participation model, but I spend most of my time conveying information, managing contributions, uh, facilitating collaboration between community members and working with our champions. Awesome, thank you very much. So I'm gonna stop sharing now uh, intentionally um, so that we can focus on uh, conversation with the panelists. So as we can see, um, I hope from the introductions, these community management roles can vary. There are various different community contexts that can need a community manager to support the engagement of members in the work of the community. So the first question that we have, um, and we'll start with Katie please, is can you describe an external facing activity that folks might recognize, they might have sort of seen happen uh, in their own communities, but pull out what happens behind the scenes as a community manager uh, in order to support that activity. Sure. So I'm going to take the example of our, um, we run monthly community calls for our community. Um, and so they're a little different from a webinar in that, you know, we have invited speakers, but our goal is usually to instigate conversation, networking, connection between the members of our community. And so these calls are an hour, an hour and a half every month. But behind the scenes, what that means is um, as a community manager, I uh, work with Lou and we recruit the speakers that we would like. We share our expectations. We actually have a lot of scaffolding built out now, documenting you know, what's expected of speakers, how they can um, use CSDC resources, that kind of thing. 
Um, and then we put together a blog post. We advertise the event. We use social media. We, we use Twitter and LinkedIn, but you know, any platform to get the word out that the event's happening. We have our events calendar on the website that um, I manage. And um, we also have a monthly newsletter, a weekly email to our Slack community that also contains all this information. And then at the call itself, just like we've done for today, we have a virtual note stock. So every call, um, members of our community add their own notes, questions, resources. So we're always co-creating on the call. Um, during the call, I'm usually the primary note taker and um, the tech backup as well. So we record our calls, we edit them so that each individual presentation can live on YouTube. Um, we found that that makes it a little bit more manageable for people to watch afterwards rather than a whole hour of a webinar. And then we archive everyone's slides if they're willing to share them write a recap blog post so that people who couldn't come to the video, come to the webinar or, or don't really enjoy watching video archives can find out what happened on a blog post. And then we share that with everyone in our various channels. And that's about it. So basically we give everyone a different mode in a way to connect. They can either come to the call and they can collaborate and co-create with us on the call. Or if they want to remain in the convey consume mode, they can just catch up on the blog post afterwards. So that's kind of how all the things that go into this one monthly event. Brilliant, thank you very much. And then Emily, what does this look like for you at Cofa Science and Society? Sure, um, so I manage a funding program that um, it is a community centered program. So this means that we invite members of the research-driven open data science community to serve on our advisory board uh, in, in which we collaborate to develop the program's governance and structure and write the request for proposals. And we also invite community members to be on our selection committee. And those are the individuals who actually review the proposals. Um, and then much of the rest of my uh, responsibilities are in convey mode in which I share the request for proposals with potential applicants and also share uh, conference planning resources and develop programming uh, for grantees um, and best practices in, in conference planning. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the community participation model and we're going to dissect the, the five different modes that I um, described. So we're going to start with um, convey consume and um, we are going to hear from the other panelists, I promise, uh, eventually, but let's just pop back over to Katie, who's going to talk a little bit about um, an example of what CSEC does in that convey consume mode. Yeah, so one of our main um, ways of connecting with both our community of practice and other key stakeholders is we put out a monthly newsletter. And I think this is probably something that every community manager does pretty much is some kind of regular communication like a newsletter. And this serves so many um, purposes. And we actually had a conversation about this in our Slack group the other day about all the different things that putting out a monthly communication can do. It connects all your members, keeps them up to date it provides a great way to, or a great platform for elevating the work of your community because you can name check folks, you can share um, links to what they're up to, new resources. Um, and then it also serves as a fantastic archive of what's going on in your community. So at the end of the year, you can come back and you can look at your 12 monthly newsletters and just, you can say, wow, look at all this crazy stuff we've done this year. This is amazing. And so, yeah, one of the, that's one of the main things we do in the, convey consume mode is our monthly communications. Fantastic. And I just want to invite everybody, um, now would be a great time to um, find the convey consume mode in the doc. And if you want to ex add examples of what you're doing in your community in this mode, we'd love to hear about them. So if you are producing a newsletter and that's something that's open and others can subscribe to, you might want to pop a link in there. There are various other things that you, you might also be doing. And so I'm going to hand back to Emily to describe non-newsletter things um, that, that you can do in the convey consume mode. Sure. So most of our conveying and consuming um, takes place on our website. We have a program website where we house our requests for proposals and also um, the resources on conference planning. Um, one of my goals is also to run a transparent funding mechanism. 
And so on our website, we also keep information about our governance structure and I post weekly updates on our program's progress um, so that people in the community are aware of, of what we're doing and how our program operates. Um, we also do um, conveying and consuming through webinars um, for, app, for potential applicants so that they can learn more about the application process. Um, and again, through um, programming, interactive programming um, for grantees on topics such as community calls, uh, event accessibility, um, and, and language access. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you very much. So yeah, feel free to keep filling in examples that you have in, in convey consume mode in the doc. And if questions are occurring to you as well, you can pop those right down at the bottom of the doc and we'll get to those in a moment. So now we want to move in to contribute mode. So often once you've conveyed something out to members, um, that invites them in to come and contribute in some way. So uh, Malin, what does that look like in the INCF community? In the INCF community, we have um, a training portal that's called Training Space that um, finds and collects and indexes training materials from the community. So one contribute thing could be to tell us, hey, we videoed the course here. You can find it on YouTube. And uh, we also pay for people to record courses when we have the budget for it, especially targeted courses that would be really useful and we don't have yet. Uh, so one contributor would be to either send it as material or just go through the course and review it and let us know maybe this should be tagged with some terms that are not in it and so on. Uh, another thing you can do is that we, as we endorse standards and best practices, we lean on our community to do the judgments because they are the experts. We are not, we are experts at people and they are experts at things. And so uh, you can uh, contribute by becoming an SPP reviewer and help us endorse and vet standards. And um, uh, besides this, we also have a bigger thing, which is a fairly gr quickly growing forum called Neurostars, which we set up a couple of years ago and it didn't really take off and it didn't really take off. And then COVID happened. And uh, we got in contact with an organization called the Neuromatch Academy, which uh, was set up to do training of PhD students and postdocs and early career researchers. So we incorporated them into our forum and we also took all their trainings materials and put them in our training space. And uh, that grew our forum enormously. We're currently at 8,000 monthly users or something like that and growing. Great, thank you very much. So, um, Alicia, what does uh, contributing look like in, in your communities? Yeah, I've got a really cool example of how the shift is pivoting. So the National Microbiome Data Collaborative, like I said, it's a pilot project and we haven't really released anything yet. And so we have um, quite a lot of like hype around something that we're still in the process of building, which as you might imagine, produces a fair bit of anxiety uh, when you're trying to, to build a community effort around something. But we just sent out a survey to just understand how the research community is working with microbiome data. And, and it, we tried to send it out to as many global partners as we could, um, ranging all the way from you know, human microbiome, human health stuff to, to the environmental microbiomes, to built environment microbiomes, because there's a huge diversity of, of people that are working in this space now. Um, and at the end of the first week, we had over 200 people respond, which I thought was actually a pretty good turnaround. Um, oh, end of the first day, sorry, we had 200 people. Now it's been a week and we have over 400 people that have responded. Um, one of the things that we did as part of the survey, because again, we don't really have anything, we don't have a data portal for people to go play with yet. Um, we're just trying to sell them on this idea. And this has been an idea in the community for a while, but we've been given money by Congress to try to make it happen. Um, we have a survey that really talks about, you know, it's, it's all anonymous so people feel like they can, they can be honest with us about their challenges. And then separate to that is coded, um, the second survey is just a one page on, if you wanna work with us, please give us your name and your contact information. And I was expecting maybe like 10% turnaround and 
Um, at the end of a week, we have over 400 responses. Over 50% of people have actually filled out the additional survey and provided their contact information because they want to contribute to this effort. And so I think that um, says a lot about what we're trying to do, but also says a lot about how invested this, this community can be. Um, so it's pretty exciting and we're looking forward to harassing everybody and getting them to work with us. Thank you. Um, so we're moving on now to the third phase. So that's the collaborate phase. And, and this you remember when I did the overview, I talked about the, the need for scaffolding and the need to um, support folks um, as they're then starting to engage with one another. And that support can look like um, various different things. So Alicia, can we come back to you and have you talk about um, what it's looked like to move into that collaborate phase together? Yeah, so the other project, um, the systems biology project, is been around a bit longer. We do have a data portal. We have a lot of open, um, open data available. All of our software is uh, open science, open license. And so there's a couple of different ways that we have tried to pivot to, to work with people in that space. Um, we have one program that's really trying to involve researchers in the conversation about how they do their science. Uh, what are your questions moving forward? What are the gaps that we're really trying to solve to do si systems level biology? And oftentimes it's things like, you know, the dark matter in the microbial world where you sequence a bunch of stuff and you have no idea what it is. Uh, uh, unknown protein comes up as the strongest annotation. Um, and so we're really working with them to understand what their questions are, and then also support their community developers to actually work with us to build tools. And so it's this concept of shifting from just giving us like, you know, user experience feedback to actually contributing to the platform and a sense of shared ownership of, you know, people tend to have a little bit um, more emotional investment in something that they've actually contributed to. So I'm trying to leverage that sort of um, sense of community to move this pattern forward towards um, people sharing data earlier, people sharing data more often, getting to that open science um, and how do you actually promote data citations prior to publication, which is um, how it's definitely very relevant to a lot of the conversations we've had as part of this conference. Awesome. And so, yeah, I love that you brought up this whole issue of, of shared ownership and power dynamics and things. So we're going to skip ahead to the, the co-create phase now. And uh, Rachel, can you tell us a bit about the um, SSI's collaborations workshop? Yes. Yeah, so um, the collaborations workshop is our annual three-day unconference event where we bring together the wider community of researchers, developer, developers, managers, funders, uh, you name it, anybody related to research software. Um, and we, we scaffold these opportunities for them to explore best, best practices and the future of research software together. Um, so even though the event does provide opportunities also for contribute and collaborate, um, we do try to incorporate as many interactive sessions as possible to facilitate this co-creation between members. Um, so we have discussion groups where we um, have groups get together to discuss various topics. And then within the session, they work together to write a speed blog, which then gets published on the SSI website. We have collaborative ideas sessions, which um, we basically randomly assign people to groups. They discuss problems that they identify within their domains and work together to come up with ideas on how to solve those challenges. And then finally, we have a hack day or a hackathon where participants work together to, to realize some of those solutions that they discuss during their collaborative idea sessions. So um, we get a lot of really great projects and collaborations coming out of this three day event. Great. And uh, Steve had a um, question in the chat of can you clarify what a speed blog is? Yeah, so a speed blog is basically just a very quick write up of the discussion. So basically the discussion groups, um, I think they're about they're between 70 to 90 minutes. And within that time, they have a discussion around a topic and write up a blog post. Thank you. And then Malin, um, in this co-create mode, can you tell us a bit about what INCF does in terms of Google Summer of Code? Uh, we have been in the Google Summer of Code since 2011, and uh, we recruit students from our community and from other communities, uh, typically data science students that are really interested in the brain but don't know much about it. And we pair them with mentors that uh, are in our scientific community, typically researchers, professors, postdocs, early career researchers, uh, not so many senior professors, they don't have the time. And um, we have the mentors uh, propose projects and we vet them minimally, but 
to a certain least level of description. And then we include all of these in a giant doc, which the students get to look at and see if they find something that's interesting or if something inspires them to send in their own um, idea for a project. And then um, these students apply to Google. Google decides how many slots you get for mentors and the organization decides itself which projects to put in those slots. And then Google pays for the students spending a summer coding on their project and everything is open source and they deliver a code object at the end. And we typically have around 20 projects now per year. And in total, we have had like 80 or 90 projects over counted over all the years. So it's a big effort and it, it doesn't cost us anything more than my job because I spend quite an amount of time on this. And it gives a lot of resources to the community. It, it's also meant to make students stay in their new communities. And uh, th that essentially means that we bring needed data scientists into the neuro community. And people who can do both neuroscience and data science are very useful in the lab. Great, thank you. So that is a, another example of community members co-creating together. So sort of doing something together that um, they don't necessarily know exactly what the, the end product's gonna look like, but, but exploring that ambiguity together. Um, to find a solution. So final question before I open it out to um, some of the questions that are in the doc or, or anything else anyone wants to raise. Um, there's the fifth uh, meta mode that I described, the, the champions mode where you support emergent leaders stepping up within your community. Rachel, can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like for you? Yep. So the Software Sustainability Institute has a fellowship program. Uh, quick plug that applications are quickly are currently open for uh, UK folk. Um, but fellows are selected to be ambassadors for research software best practices and advocates for openness within their domains and area of work. Um, so that's how we sort of like reach out into into various different research domains to to spread best best practice uh, related to. Um, computation. And so fellows receive funding to support activities such as organizing and participating in workshops or training, attending at uh, conferences or presenting at conferences, and also nurturing their own communities of practice. Um, fellows also uh, give back to the SSI by contributing to the running of institute events such as collaborations workshop. Uh, they input into institute projects and collaborate on policy and funding proposals. Fantastic. And then Alicia, can we just have the, the uh, perspective from NMDC about what this uh, sort of champions mode looks like to support emerging leaders? Sure. Um, again, you know, this is a new project. So a lot of our champions are, are people that are already uh, vocal advocates for sharing data and making data fair. And so what we're trying to do is just leverage them um, to really market that to a broader audience um, and support their efforts too. So we do a lot of uh, work to just kind of uh, prop up their um, their current efforts. We are gonna be starting a formal ambassadors program um, this coming spring with the idea of actually rolling out people into the community to um, work with people on, on how to make their microbiome data fair. So to Mullen's point earlier, like really driving home standards and the adoption of community standards, because in order to find data, you actually have to have some standards for the machines behind the scene to actually be able to deliver that up. So really trying to push out this concept of standard adoption across the community. And we want our ambassadors to be the face of, of the program. You know, while our leadership team, you know, is fairly, um, well balanced for, for gender roles. We're not overly diverse in other areas. And so we wanna make sure that we are intentionally recruiting from communities that want to see themselves as part of us. And so making sure that we're able to uh, reflect the, the community back to them and say, you know, these are members of, these are ambassadors for our program and you too can be one of these. And so really building out that intentionality, um, both in terms of the diversity that we wanna see um, and then also driving home the need for standards in order to make this possible. Awesome, thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna move over to um, 
questions from everybody else now, please. So um, I'm down in the Google Doc in the section called questions. And the first question here says, how do you avoid burnout or overtaxing the generosity within the community? So, um, you know, essentially what we're doing here with this participation model is describing that members might choose to engage in um, any one of a number of different modes and that we're not necessarily uh, assuming that, you know, everybody is going to get to a deep level of commitment. Um, You'll notice as well on the diagram, the arrows go in both directions. So folks are able to sort of move forward and drop back as their energy and, and other commitments allow them to. So I think a lot of what we do as community managers is, like I said, lowering the barriers for them to transition between the modes if they want to, um, while also, um, you know, allowing for the fact that folks are going to um, wax and wane in their energy levels and, and that that's okay. We need to be respectful of that. But let me throw that out to the panelists. Anybody else want to add how you've handled this question of uh, being respectful of people's energy levels and not kind of overtaxing the generosity of community members who are often engaging for free? Yeah, Malin. Um, we count on all our members being extremely busy, busy or upwards. So basically the professors are really hard to reach because they get too much email and they don't have time to click on newsletters and so on. So uh, at the professor level, we send them newsletters and emails and we hope that they read them sometime. And uh, we concentrate many of our efforts on postdocs and early career researchers who have a lot of skill and still a fair amount of time to put into pro projects of different kinds. So our governing structures are fairly senior people and our active producing structures like working groups and so on are typically younger people with more time to spend and less to lose if they spend time with us. Great, thank you. Any, any of the other panelists want to add anything? As we move to the next question. The only thing I would add is I think one of the one of the kindest things you can do to your volunteers, do to them, for them, is to offer clear expectations and all the scaffolding that they need for onboarding and offboarding into whatever task they're asked. So that, yeah, they know, oh, okay, I'm gonna be on this committee for six months. Here's how many meetings I'm gonna to have to attend. And here's our final product that we'll put out. And, you know, having all that outlined up front can really help with burnout. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, the next question was, I'm assuming much of this role, the community manager role, actually becomes documentation, standard operating procedures, onboarding, et cetera, et cetera. How does one maintain a balance between community generated material resources and ideas with the capacity of an efficient system to document, surface, recall and progress the community's goals? So I would push back a little bit and say um, uh, we don't only do documentation. So um, we actually have a skills wheel. It's a completely different workshop. But we've created a skills wheel of the five core competencies of community managers and the competency that actually resonates a lot um, with folks is the interpersonal one. So a lot of this is about uh, brokering trust. It's about listening, mentoring, um, understanding um, ways to create these these pathways to engagement. Um, and that that isn't always about um, documenting that, you know, sometimes that is about having a conversation. It's about um, you know, facilitating a, a discussion such that um, everything that needs to be discussed is able to do so. But let me throw this out to the panelists. Um, what perspectives do you have on sort of the role of documentation in your communities? You know, how do you not get overwhelmed by writing everything down and still stay focused on the, the overall mission of the community? Go ahead, Emily. Yeah, go ahead, Emily. Yeah, I just want to echo what Katie said um, in response to the last question, that it's really important to have um, really detailed documentation for your volunteers. Um, so personally, in my role, as I've been developing and managing um, this new program over the last year, a lot of what I've done has been documentation. Um, so what is expected of our advisory committee members? How should our selection committee be reviewing proposals? Um, making sure all of this is written down um, so that people are aware of what their expectations are um, and, and how they should be um, working together. Um, but also, I think it um, relates a lot to transparency and being able to share a lot of this documentation with the community so that they understand um, our processes and how we run the program. 
And I think also, you know, your best collaborator is future you. Um, so in doing yourself a favor and writing everything down because inevitably you'll be doing these things multiple times. And so that way you don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. Yeah, big plus one to that. Rachel, did you want to add something? She literally just finished on what I was going to say. Um, yeah, <laughs> documentation um, is really good for transparency about what you're, what you're doing for your community, but it's also super useful for yourself, especially if you are repeating things from year to year. Mm. Great. And then the next question in the doc was, how can we co-manage across many overlapping communities with lots of similar goals and purposes? Uh, you know, how many community calls can a single person actually attend? Um, this is something we're also um, really interested in, right? Characterizing the communities that are out there, the things that make them um, distinct and how much we might be tugging folks uh, in multiple directions, given that they actually belong to, to several of these communities. Do any of the panelists want to um, add a perspective on this from, from managing um, their own communities? Um, I actually struggle with this. Well, I don't know if that struggle is the right word, but we encounter this a lot, especially with our fellows who are nurturing their own communities and have a lot of their own events. And I think the best thing you can do is just amplify each other and, and collaborate on these things and work together um, because then you can potentially um, limit the amount and you can also delegate and, and share the responsibility of the work and also um, just, yeah, have a stronger, stronger output or event or activity back to collaboration um someone mentioned that community calls end up on youtube so what do you do for consent and also how do you encourage full complete frankness honesty and openness with the members uh, if the calls are recorded and eventually go to the public for anyone to view yeah katie do, do, can i kick this back to you to sort of explain our rationale behind this for sure so um we only record the presentation portions of our calls the discussions are not recorded and then we only publish the actual presentation with the speaker on YouTube. So we get permission from the speaker to share their presentation. And if they don't want to, then we don't publish it. Um, we realize that is an accessibility thing, an issue for people who couldn't attend. But I think at the end of the day, the presenter's intellectual property protection also matters. So yeah, we do seek those permissions and we do not record the discussions that we do on our community calls. Great. Okay, so we are running tight on time now. So um, in the final two minutes as we wrap up, um, I just want to ask each of the panelists to leave us uh, with a final closing thought. So um, Alicia, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I think um, related to some stuff that was mentioned earlier, for me, it's really about making sure that you meet your community members where they are. So that participation model is quite broad and there's lots of different activities and programming that you can do to enable people to, to step in and join where they're comfortable. And you can move back and forth across that community model. People have children, people move, have different jobs, we have a pandemic. And so a lot of that is making sure to be very transparent and inclusive when you offer opportunities so that people can join where they feel comfortable. Everybody wants to contribute, but not everybody can contribute as much as they want to all of the time. And, and making sure that that space is okay. Great, Rachel, what would you like to leave us with? Yeah, I'll just echo Alicia. I think those are all really great points. Um, just saying that, yeah, not everybody can meet you where you you don't take it personally if people don't engage at the level that you want. Um, it is important to have that empathy and compassion with your community members, especially during a, a really volatile time like this. So um, yeah, beating your members where they are, I think is a really great point made by Alicia. Great. Um, Malin, what would you like to leave us with? Document everything more than the human think you need and save your emails. I'm the currently oldest in work year person at my org and my email archive is very useful. Great. And then we have 50 seconds. So very briefly, Emily and then Katie, what would you like to leave us with? Yeah, I think a lot about how to lower barriers to participation. Um, so think about, you know, e echoing again what the other panelists have said, um, think about what resources and support your community members need. Um, and I also think a lot about transparency. Um, so making sure that people in the community are aware of your processes and your governance um, and how your, your program is run. 
Thank you. And Katie, in the final 22 seconds. Um, be strategic. And this model is really helpful for figuring out um, what you're doing in each mode, why you're doing it, and how to avoid overloading yourself, your team, and